Today, on Arshi and Gaia's Voyager, we will be talking about the episode, The 37s. Now, I gotta say something right off the bat. The 37s is one of the episodes I've seen most covered in Voyager's uh, various rev in the various reviews of Voyager, and the general commonality is exactly the same, and yes, I'm gonna be repeating it because it's true. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna not say it just because it's been said before. That being said, I just wanted to warn you guys, because some of this may sound like rep repetition. The 37s is season two, basically in a nutshell. What we have in 37s, uh, well, okay, this is the episode in which they counter various people from the 1930s, including Amelia Earhart, and find out about this human civilization that exists here in the Delta Quadrant that was brought here by the great ancient aliens of Doom, which we overrun, and we're like, yes, we win! And that's basically the plot synopsis in a nutshell there. Now... I'm trying to think of an analogy that I haven't already heard. If you could imagine someone drawing a beautiful picture and really going out of and not drawing one, sketching it, sketching out this beautiful picture, and it's all in place, all the pieces are there, all the outlines are there, it's very well done, and all they have to do is sit back and paint it, okay? Rather than paint it, they take a big bucket of paint and fling it at the canvas as hard as they can. So what you have is this glob of paint where the framework is just barely visible. That's season two in a nutshell. There is so... I've mentioned this so many times, but this is where it really gets bad. In Season 1, there was potential on display, and it kind of lived up for it and mostly didn't. In Season 2, there is there is still potential on display. In fact, arguably more potential on display. And then they take it and they just kind of start flinging poo at it, because screw it, you know? I mean, oh my god. It, it's, it's actively bad. <sighs> I don't care for this episode, by the way, if that's not obvious. I don't care for most of these episodes, if that's not obvious. <sighs> I know this is well-tread territory, but this, this episode really does summarize all of Season 2 in a nutshell. The very first word we hear in this whole episode is the word rust. And that is Season 2 right there. One word description, one syllable description. Bam. Rust. <sighs> I don't want to go too much into the details of this, because again, this is re retreading territory, but the 37s had so much dynamic on p potential... And, uh, okay. First of all, we have several things that by themselves could make an episode by... It. We've got humans in the Delta Quadrant. By itself, that is a plot point. We've got the ancient race of aliens which brought them there, which is almost never mentioned... It is literally never mentioned again, and not even relevant to this episode per se. It's just there for backdrop. That could have been a huge plot element as well. And then we have a third plot element within this one episode. Amelia frickin' Earhart. I'm sorry, but when you bring Amelia Earhart onto the show, do something with her. I'm going to go ahead and say this now. This is skipping ahead quite a bit. They don't do anything with Amelia Earhart. And in fact, you'll notice in my changes section, I eject her. Uh, the Well, I sort of eject her. Basically, completely. Because they do nothing with her. Now, I've heard several changed versions of this before that take it in a completely different ver uh, direction. So you'll forgive me for completely ignoring that and going in my own route. But I just thought I'd mention it because, God, really? Now, I do have to nitpick something. I, I have to, because I've been, uh, this has been on my mind for a very long time. In Star Trek, they'll be like, on the screen, and then it'll show something. Now, here, let me pull up the camera so I can show you what I'm talking about, okay? On the screen! This isn't even close enough. This isn't far away. You know, it's like this, right? It's going, do, do, it's a Borg ship or something. Just, just go with it. Do, do, and then they always say, magnify! <laughs> and then it comes up here, right? So you can actually see that this is a notepad now, okay? Why is that step necessary? Why isn't it when you say on screen, it doesn't mean I would like to see the object on screen. Instead, it's just point the camera in the general direction of where it's at. Why is the magnify step necessary? I have never understood that in all of Star Trek. And it's just something I felt like mentioning because this is really bad. What's that? I don't know. On the screen. Chunk. And the funny thing is she waits about a quarter of a second. On screen. Chunk. Magnify. Chunk. Because she knows it's, it's like the captain knows whoever's running it is just going to do this thing. And they're like, just, okay, yeah, magnify, come on, I want to actually see it, please. You can almost hear it in Mulgrew's tone. It's like, come on. <sighs> now, I will have to say, this actually does have a good teaser, in all honesty, to give this episode some credit. It's quick, it's to the point, it catches your interest like that. The idea is all there right off the bat. There is a truck in space in the Delta Quadrant. Enough said. Literally, enough said. Don't have to go any other detail whatsoever. There's a truck out here. Oh my gosh. 
interest, you know, interest level peaked, right? I would like to also point out that the truck being in space is never actually explained because, you know, all the other stuff with regard to the people over here is very planet bound. But whatever. Um, one of the things I have to mention here is Paris, Tom Paris. He continues to be competent, manages to identify the, the truck to the year, I might add, and uh, figures out how to get it working and what stuff. I'll talk about that in just a second, but I have to mention, I like Tom Paris. I do. And I admit one of the reasons I like him is that he is actually written to be competent. That being said, it is possible to go from competent to Mary Sue a little bit too easily, and in a lot of season two, it gets a little silly just how over-competent Tom Paris gets, and this is a good example of that. He is the only person in the entire room, which consists of Tuvok, Balana, Harry Kim, and Janeway. Every single one of those members have already been established as someone who, at the very least, has a very big brain in their particular field, and is very good at what they do. And it is Tom Paris who basically dances circles around them in the competence department. I mean, really? I, I like you, Tom, but god damn. Now... Okay, I'm trying to think of how to start, so forgive me for this pause here. I have talked before about how in certain types of fiction, especially Star Trek, more often than not you have to accept a, sil accept a silly premise in order to enjoy an episode. Uh, faces, I talked about that back there. B beautiful example, we have split Balana into two people. Just go with it, because we have a great episode. It's, 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 there's a purpose behind it, is my point. Now here's the catch, and this is my whole, you know, it depends on the circumstances philosophy coming out in a nutshell here. It depends on the circumstances. If you want to make us accept something stupid because you have a good reason for it, fine. If you want us to accept something stupid so you can make a retarded joke, no. This episode has a truck which has been flying through space, which still has gasoline in it, which still has a charge in the battery, which still has the key in the thing, and which still starts. All of these things, every single one of these things is just stupider than the last. And anybody who knows anything about physics knows exactly what I mean. And even anybody who doesn't know about physics still knows what I mean. This truck has been floating through space for... We don't literally don't even know how long. And it starts up just fine. If you had gone somewhere with that, we would have been with you. Instead, you do it to make a stupid joke about how stupid everyone is and make everyone jump at the... Pow, pow from, the from the truck thing. Once again, Voyager tries comedy and fails miserably. They don't always fail. There are funny moments in their show, but God, people. This is like this is literally the textbook example of how not to try and stretch the audience's uh, suspension of disbelief. <sighs> what else we got here? So this is the episode in which the ship lands. Uh, there's actually only really two episodes where that happens, Basics and this one, both in Season 2. Now... The ship landing was intended to be a draw of sorts. It was intended to them kind of show off what they could do with this. And the problem is having a ship that's atmospheric gives you some options. Having a ship that lands doesn't. Okay? All it does is allow you to have the ship land instead of a shuttle or instead of a transporter. And effectively, from a, from a viewer perspective and from a writing perspective, there's no actual difference there. So, actually, I guess they land one other time in Planet L. I forgot about that. God. Sorry, moving on. Um, I actually forgot about that. The point being, it's a big draw. It, it's like saying this balloon has pink on it, and that's its draw. No, that that's not even going far. Let me really think about this here. Um, I've got this balloon, but I've also got this balloon, which is slightly different. But this balloon being slightly different, that's the draw. Look. It's slightly different. Oh my god. Yeah, you know, I don't get where they were going with this. I really don't. If they wanted to show off some effect shots and whatnot, sure, but they they really go into this thing. And the now the I feel like I'm being petty. I really do. Because every time I watch that scene where the ship lands, I'm just kind of rolling my eyes and groaning the whole time. Like, uh, I just want to skip through it. And I've been trying to figure out why, and this time around, I had to watch this episode a second time, as I, I think I mentioned in one of my takes of the Initiations video, uh, which is the next video that you'll be seeing, but it's one I've already done my way. Uh, don't ask. Um, 
And I think I finally nailed it down. I actually had a side note here. Right here. The music destroys that scene. The, it, I was watching it and I was trying to get a point for why it didn't like it, because as I really started analyzing it, everything they said, with the exception of like two tidbits of Technobabble, made sense. Everything they were doing made sense. Everything they, they were within the confines of their own science and actual real science, all of it made sense, all of it was legitimate, all of it was appropriate. Why didn't I like this scene? And it's the music. I know I've talked at least in brief before about Voyager's music and the problems with it, and I've also t I've made this very clear in many times that music is an extremely important thing to me. If you ha if you are going to make a, cho a musical choice for a scene, make it a good choice. If you know what I mean, you know, the use of non-music, as I've talked about in Half Life Two, or the use of music that is appropriate to the scene, as in virtually every Final Fantasy ever, you know. Use it. It's a tool. It is a tool as a director, as a creator, as a producer, in order to emphasize your scene. Don't use this generic, out-of-the-can crap. You know? That is something Voyager has such a huge problem with. Ever since they fired uh, uh, Ron Moore, I want to say, back in TNG, Star Trek's music in general, this is a problem in Deep Space Nine some, uh, for the most part, too, is that it is so generic. It's the same danger music. It's the same big event music. It's the same something kind of happy ha happened music. You know, it's all the same canned crap. And there's no emotion to it. There's no effort point. It's like... This is going to be a little... This is going to sound a little elitist, okay? There's no avoiding this. A friend of mine got an application on his iPad where he could point, he could basically hit a button, one button, and it would extrapolate from that button a tune, okay? So he could go, and at any given point in time he could hit another button, and when it cycled around in the, in the measures, it would then move to another tune based on that thing, and it would segue down using the same instruments, right? And in this he created a song. No, oh, okay, that's kind of cool, but the song was utterly devoid of anything. It was just noise. There was and now, uh, granted, I'm I'm big on music. I've said this before, but in to my ears, all I was hearing was da 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 da. You know, there was it was generic. It was canned. There was nothing there. When you sit down and actually put something of yourself into a song, which many composers do, most composers do for that matter, it comes out as more. Allow me to compare this to the most severe example I could come up with within Star Trek. The episode Best of Both Worlds 1, okay? For those of you who haven't seen it, go out and see it. Right now, go, right now. I'm waiting. Okay, go ahead and pause the video. I'll go ahead and wait. I'm just going to wait here like this. Okay, you've watched the episode now. The music in that episode was exactly what it needed to be. It was tailored to the scenes. It was tailored to the episode. You could feel the emphasis. You could feel the heart. It's it's not something entirely tangible or quantifiable, and I, I admit that's why this sounds kind of elitist, but I believe I'm saying this with earnestness. I'm saying this with truthfulness, in, in my opinion. You know, when you have canned, generic elevator music, it's just... Da, 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 da. When you have... You actually feel something. Imagine how much more impacting the scene would have been if, if while they're landing, instead of the duh, this is kind of the Apollo 11 thing going on, duh, 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 duh. instead it had been um, something a lot more lower beat, uh, something with strings, something with like a, a continuous chord going through the background of... And have and as the, as the thing as the scene goes on as they continue to land this chord got higher and higher and higher and just a little bit louder so as the scene's going on it becomes more and more obvious that this this note this chord actually is going on in the background as the rest of the strings are slowly increasing in pace in the foreground as as you know it's da 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 you know just something anything. <sighs> Now, ironically, I have very little else to say about this episode. I, I have actually have a mention here that Amelia Har Earhart is just a waste, but I have to actually add to that. Not only is she a waste, every single one of the guest stars is a waste. The only guest star that ex actually matters to the plot in any way, shape, or form is the guy whose name I don't even remember with the gun, who was with, who was, you know, the love interest of Amelia Earhart. The drunk, you know? You have several people, several of whom basically have one line or none, and their only job is to stand there and go. Speaking as a writer, 
if you're going to go out of your way to add characters to your scenes or to your episode, do something with them. Don't just have them stand there. Don't just have them do nothing. Don't just have them take up space. And and this is all even more compounded because, again, the main guest star, Amelia freaking Earhart, they do nothing with. <sighs> Now, I want to actually make a note about the Beautiful Cities, but I know this has been commented on before. Uh, this is the budget issue rearing its head. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes Voyager makes some really dumb budget choices. I'll mention this again in my initiations review, which I've already done. Um, actually, I don't think I did mention that. <laughs> in my fourth take. Whatever. I get that there's budget problems. I get that there's issues. I get that there are you know, you have to work within your budget, and a budget isn't necessarily per episode basis. You have to plan out. You have to make sure there's enough budget left for the next several episodes you have to do, right? I get that. What that means is that you then have to be specific about what you use the budget on. So let's use the budget on the ship landing rather than, oh, I don't know, something that'll actually add to the story. Now... I bring this up because of the beautiful cities thing. For those of you who have seen this episode or watched this just prior, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't, they talk about how they have these beautiful cities, these beautific paradise cities. Oh my god, they've built this paradise on this planet. And that's one of the main points of the episode. In fact, that is arguably the dilemma of the entire episode, is the fact that there is this paradise. Uh, you know, Earth is a paradise, this is a paradise. I'm sorry. In initiations, I'll mention this again, but oh, <laughs> I really shouldn't have done these out of order. The whole Earth is a Paradise thing is something that I have been in favor of for various literary reasons, and this is actually a good example of that. Earth is a Paradise. This planet is a Paradise. Now, that may sound like just simple, you know, copy-pasting, but my point is, this is the closest thing to home these people will probably ever see. And I mean that because there is no real hope that they will actually get back before they have died of old age. This is as, This is very likely as close as it's ever going to get for them. That's the temptation. That's the dilemma. Are they going to stay? So, since this is an absolutely crucial plot point, why not spend your budget on, oh, the beautiful cities, rather than the damn ship landing? That being said, I am actually willing to be more lenient on this than most people I know, because one of the things to, to mention is that this is a hell of a lot better than any technology we've ever come up with to date. So... If they had been a little bit more verbose in explaining the cities, if they had just gone into more detail and vocalized it a little bit more, I think it would have worked a lot better. It wouldn't have felt as cheap. Because as is, it feels like a clear budget cut. They could have made it that they didn't want to show the cities in the episode, because whatever they show couldn't get across the point as well as our own imaginations could. That can be done. It's been done before, in Star Trek for that matter. So I would have preferred if they'd gone that route. And of course, nobody stays to cho chooses to stay behind on this beautific, wonderful planet. Nobody does, on the whole ship. Yeah, whatever. One last note. I don't encourage you to do this. Uh, I don't drink, as I've mentioned before, for many, many reasons. But you could make a drinking game out of this damn episode. Would you like to know why? Ancient Earth. Ancient history. This is an ancient SOS to scroll. Th this was used to describe the ancient ways of... Trans you know, all of the, the word ancient is used in this episode... I, I think at least 11 or 12 times, something like that. I, I, I had stopped counting at a certain point. And this is, that's another thing that I, I cannot stand about uh, some of the Voyager writers in a nutshell, is calling anything that is prior to Star Trek ancient, including... Uh, you know what? No, I'm not even going to go... Not going into it. Just going to let it go. I just thought I'd mention it. Uh, for those of you out there who do not drink, uh, I'd like to mention that there is another thing you can do in place of the drinking game that I myself do. It's called the Oreo game and I think you can already figure out the point. Uh, one time we were watching, uh, me and uh, the little one, we were watching Fellowship of the Ring, and we uh, started doing the Oreo game to the word doom. Anytime anybody said the word doom in any context, you know, Mount Doom or We Are Doomed, we went through that whole thing before the movie ended, the whole package of it. It was hilarious. And by the end of it, we're like, ah, oh, too many Oreos. <laughs> but it was awesome. Just thought I'd share that. No. My changes section for this is another one of the circumstances where I stated a situation. I said, what is the core plot? As you know, one of my limitations for myself is I have to stay within the confines of whatever the core plot elements are. In this case, I felt that there were two things that could be argued, but I ultimately decided that the failure of the episode meant that Amelia Earhart was not the core element. 
the 37s, the human society being out in the Delta Quadrant, that was the core element. Now, I'm not going to go into full detail on this like I normally do, because this is actually part of a, an episode, uh, a multi-episode thread. Not, a, not one of my huge things, like the Conclave or the Terranach or Seska. This is something that's going to be relevant in a couple episodes here in Season 2. Because you know me, I like to plan ahead. So I'm not going to go into full detail, is all I'm saying here. They still encounter the, the SOS signal. The SOS signal means that there's a planet. Now, the basic way this would start is the episode starts with John, uh, John, Tom, making uh, a, a, a vintage Ford, okay? And showing his chops in that manner and saying he's almost got everything right. And he turns on the AM radio and starts going through, and he's the one who picks up the SOS, okay? Now, they're actually rather confused by that, and they think, well, is that part of the thing? And he's like, no, it shouldn't be picking up anything. And then, so they run it through the ship's sensors, and they find out, yep, there's there's an SOS thing there. And Harry gives his explanation for why they usually don't scan on that bod, and it would also explain why most others wouldn't, too. So there is a basic SOS that has been transmitted for however long in the region. They try to extrapolate on its location, they figure it out, they get to this planet. This planet is a dump, okay? It's got lots of storms, it has uh, an extensive amount of cloud cover, there are zero useful resources on it, and it's like type, uh, I don't know, X or something like that, you know, almost inhospitable, okay? Whether or not you land the ship is something I don't give a damn about, to be a little bit blunt. I think it would have worked better if they'd taken down shuttles, if I'm honest. But whatever, they take the shuttles down, because they have to investigate. I mean, the mere fact that there's an SOS means there might have been some kind of human life here at some point in time. They ha Now, I want to stress this because this is actually very relevant to the overall core plot here. They have a specific and divisive reason to try and check out this planet. Otherwise, they wouldn't even bother. And I, and I stress that no resources thing, because that's going to be important in a bit. They land, and they find that the planet is beautiful. Very clearly class him. They came down with all the masks and everything, they take them off and they're like, this is this is fine, what what the heck? And as they start to look around, they discover that, their sensor, that there's a fairly large sensor web in place, e even there, phys physically, that it stretches across fairly large portions of the continent that are preventing, you know, sensors from space from scanning anything properly. And they're, they're like, uh, why would anyone go so, to such trouble to hide this place? And they, uh, go ahead and trace the SOS call, and it doesn't lead to the plane, the Enola Gay. Instead, it leads to a shrine of sorts, okay? Now, this, when I say a shrine of sorts, I mean... Um, like the pyramids at Giza, okay? Except a little less touristy. There's no actual um, tourist attraction. There's no actual, you know, check, get your photos here, or anything like that. And there's no nearby roads or anything like that. It's just out in the middle of nowhere. And they go and they examine it. Uh, not that size, by the way. I don't mean literally. Just you get the point. And it's the shrine. And there's several statues throughout there. And all of your, and there's a the SOS just call in the middle, which is still being transmitted. It, now it's being powered by some obviously alien device, but the the actual transmitter, the SOS transmitter, is legitimately a human old transmitter that's still working. And it's clear that it's been you know Tom, someone who is experienced at recreating old stuff, as we established in the very first scene, looks at this and says this isn't actually, this has been re redesigned, this has been modeled after one, you could tell, because of blah and blah and blah, right? And as they're going through, they look at these statues, and they see statues of, uh, you know, various historical figures, uh, several people who, and I would, I would like to go for the less known historical figures. I'd have to actually sit down and make a list if I was actually to do that. I'm not going to do that here. But one of them would be Amelia Earhart, and Janeway's like, oh my god, you know. And why is there a statue to Amelia Earhart here? And... As they and you know, then they spend some time discussing this, and they look at these people, and you know, they're, they're pulling up some of the history on their tricorder, and it's like, you know, but but Janeway doesn't have to look at anything because she knows the story of Amelia Earhart, and she knows that he she disappeared, and she knows the story of that guy over there and this guy over there, and Tuvok mentions, you know, that guy uh, was someone we learned about at the academy, and blah blah blah, and they all look at each other. Why are all these people from Earth's history enshrined in statues here with an SOS call right in the middle of it going? And this is the point at which the others, you know, the humans in disguise, attack. And they're like, oh my god, you know, and they end up having the fight. And it be, it, beca it again stops rather quickly because the, the people realize they're human. You know, take off their own masks and say, you're human. And again, I would have their, their the, the full body armor type thing, uh, especially because the whole point is to hide their identity. I'll get to that in just a bit. Finally, we have Exposition Central. 
What ends up happening is he describes the fact that over 400 years ago, there was an alien race that had a technology of some kind of folding space ability. It was very powerful, but it was very specific. In other words, it couldn't go anywhere in the galaxy. It could go to certain positions that were uh, of appropriate gravimetric relation to the to the galactic, galactic core. One of those happened to be near the Sol system, you know, near Earth. And they had visited on more than one occasion during the past and started bringing people on board the ship, uh, basically to commune with. Now, these were not slavers or anything like that. These were just people who were explorers who wanted to know more about the galaxy and more about these people. And so, uh, as they find out, there's more than just humans here. There's actually quite a few races here uh, from across the galaxy. Excuse me. I would also have... Uh, uh, some of the races from the the Gamma Quadrant, if I had my option here, uh, at least mentioned as some of the races that are also here, to get across the point that there's people from all over the place. Now, of course, as they're describing this, you know, the obvious point comes up, oh my god, do you still have this technology? Where are these people? Because the, the, the connection is right there. These people obviously have traveled to Earth. We could use this to travel to Earth, or at the very least near enough to Earth that it doesn't matter. The catch is twofold. One, they do not have any of the technology you know, they've, they've basically been uh, here on this planet for some time in hiding. I'll get to that in just a bit. And B, the aliens themselves haven't been seen in some time. And they, at one point, maintained a, uh, a separate planet of their own. And, of course, uh, several questions would be asked. The first and foremost would be, why all the, this effort to hide yourselves? He would reveal that the aliens, the uh, Baori, I guess, I, I don't remember what they were called, it doesn't matter necessarily, but let's go ahead and call them the Baori, because that's what I remember right now. Um, I should make a note of that so I don't forget when I get to the next episode they're in. Um, Baori, Baori, there we go. Um, the Baori basically told them, uh, we're going to set up this technology in order to hide you. We are being hunted. Okay? Now, they gave them the ability to communicate across certain subspace bands one with another, and he reveals that this is not the only colony like this. You know, this is just one planet. There's actually several stretched throughout the, this particular uh, sector of space, including one which has the aliens themselves, the Beore themselves. And they try very much not to keep in communication with each other, because any time they send any message, they send the risk of being caught, you know, they send the risk of being found. And Jane would, be, would ask the obvious question, then, well, why do you leave the SOS going? And he's like, well, we nobody has ever detected that before, because nobody around here knows what that is, or what that means, or even monitors the frequency it's on. And then he reveals that that SOS thing and the shrine is a shrine to various people who helped build the society up to the way it was, who helped found this new world, basically. And the SOS thing has been kept there as a, as a memento, as a sort of a, as, as a mento, as a shrine, you know, this is we are honoring our past history because even though these aliens gave them, you know, brought them with them, it was people like Amelia Earhart and whoever else who actually said, you know, we want, if if you're not going, we want to make a new home of this. We want to be on the frontier. And so they sat, settled down on this planet that they're on and actually made this new society and all that stuff. Now, uh, let's see if I've covered all the important parts. Um... He, uh, one of the things that will be mentioned is, you know, they, they'd very much like to get in contact with these aliens and see if they still have this technology, and the guy says, and you know, they explain why. And the guy says, of course, absolutely. And, and he would probably also mention as an aside, if for whatever reason we can't or we don't get a hold of them, surely you can stay here as well. And that would also bring, because uh, I think that was a good dilemma, and is a dilemma that should have been mentioned. And, <coughs> excuse me, one that should have been brought up, in my opinion. Now... As they get back to the ship, this would be a good section for Janeway to just kind of talk about Amelia Earhart and how she's always been one of her uh, personal heroes from history. You know, I, I wouldn't have kept, cut that section. I actually thought that was pretty good. I just wish they'd actually done more with the character. But in this case, it's irrelevant because Earhart's been dead for f 350 years, you know? Instead, she's just talking about how Earhart was even more of a hero than she even realized because she was one of the people who, f who helped found a new world, a whole new society. It, it, 70,000 light years away from home. I can't believe that. You know, just that just adds to the whole mystique and the whole layer of that. And she wishes, and you know, she would say things like, I wish I could have met her. I wish I could have seen what she was like and shook her hand and just asked, you know, oh, my God, woman, you know, that kind of a thing. Really have the hero worship thing on her. I think that would have worked very well. And uh, we would have seen more of Janeway in that, too, because we see that Janeway herself is... We would see the explorative side of Janeway, the, the, the desire to be on the frontier side. And one of the things... I, I've, I mentioned this in every episode. I like to at least develop some characterization within this one. This one would actually develop Janeway to an extent. 
the basic idea here is that while she is very good at science, and she has always been very good at science, and her career in Starfleet has been completely science-oriented from the beginning, what she has always wanted to do was to be an explorer. And she would admit in her own guilty way to whoever she's talking to, um, I don't know, probably Tom, actually, in this case, she would admit that in her own guilty way she is actually grateful that they're stranded out here because for the first time in her life she's actually capable of doing what she wants. And then, of course, she, she feels so horrible about that, that feeling. She feels so horrible about voicing it and being like, God, I can't believe I'm such a terrible person because she's so conflicted on the matter. And Tom would try to console her by saying, there is no part of you that would have intentionally stranded us here specifically to so satisfy your own selfish whims. We know that, Captain. I know that. I know you better than that. There's nothing wrong, there's no shame in admitting that you are trying to make something good out of something bad. And, you know, just have the two bond a little bit. And ha no, not romantically, just just get closer as friends and, and reveal more about Janeway as a character. I would have liked to see that. Now, various of the dilemmas of this episode are going to go kind of unresolved, and that is by, that is on purpose. First of all, he will mention that they do not get in contact with the aliens at all. They get zero contact back. And in fact, they did get a hold of one of the other settlements, which also mentions they have not had contact with these aliens for some time. For uh, almost several years at this point, okay? And Janeway says, is there any chance you could give us their location? And the guy says, of course, yes, please, here. We would like to know what's happening, too. You know, we want to know what's happened to our benefactors. And uh, no, no Half-Life 2 pun intended here. And so, you know, she she takes the thing and goes out, and he mentions, so did anyone take you up on your offer? And this is when we find out more about Janeway's character, because she has been so hesitant to mention it at all. She hasn't actually told anyone about this offer yet. And again, it's that humanity there. One of the things that defines humanity is being flawed. It, it, it's an uncomfortable truth, but it is a very much a truth. And this is Janeway being flawed. She doesn't want to mention it because she doesn't want to m lose any more of her crew. She has reached the point at this point in the series where she is actually friends with so many of this crew. And I just showed that in the episode, in the scene where she was just with Tom. Tom is not just her navigator or her, her helm officer. She, he is a friend of hers, you know? She doesn't want to lose that. And so I, I, would, I would have it cut from that straight to her basically sitting in her study thinking and wondering and 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 honestly if i was if i was given full directorial license here i would have a scene uh, i'd say about 30 seconds long it doesn't have to be very long of just her thinking very quiet in the dark just thinking and i know mulgrew can put that kind of emotion into her face of being completely torn of being completely thing and and the, towards the end of it she just closes her eyes as she realizes the truth of it and she lowers her head and then, uh, you know, she's having a... We cut to her having a staff meeting and saying they've they've offered for us to stay. And, you know, Harry, for example, points out, what do you mean, us? All of us, the whole ship, if we really want to. They they would still like to know what's happening with, uh, with the... With the... B B Baori? God, I've already forgotten it. Yes. With the Baori, but after that, we're free to stay. And... I've uh, I've been looking over their 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 cloak basically their their technology it's very sound, and I've been t and I've been talking with Neelix about it. And Neelix pipes up, you know, yeah, I mean, I've never even heard of this place. This is so remote. There's not even a story about you know ghost stories or there's this horrible thing. No, no, no. This place is just worthless. Nobody cares about being here. And no, and Tuvok would point out, you know, any any inherently defensive situation is always going to fail. Now, in case you're you're not getting the real point here, these planets, these colonies, along with the one the Beori are in, are in the Terranok Alliance lands. They're in their territory. The only way they have stayed completely off the radar is by hiding their planets with these fields, which make them look worthless. Worthless to colonize, and worthless to mine. Nothing worth a damn on these planets, and it has worked so far. The obvious point, and what Tuvok is bringing up, is that that kind of philosophy will not, by its nature, last forever. And so if they stay here, while it may work for now, it may not work forever. Maybe we should be thinking about more of a long-term thing. And, you know, Harry would then pipe up, you know, well, maybe we should offer for them to join us. Join us in our ship. And, and you know, someone also point out the obvious. We don't have enough space for that many people. Well, maybe they have ships. No, they, they've cannibalized all their ships at this point. You know, and, and this debate would just go back and forth. Until finally Janeway would just say, Right now, we can't do much for these people, but they have offered a hand in friendship, and I, I feel I am doing you a disservice as my friends to not mention it to you. As much as I don't want to lose you, 
I will understand if you want to put down roots. Now, I like this better than the scene they did in the episode, because this is her and the senior staff, the main characters, who at this point, as I've already established in many episodes, have developed a degree of friendship, have become something of a family together. This is Janeway telling her family, I don't want to lose you, but I understand if you want to go. And thus actually panning across the faces of Harry and Chakotay and Tom and Tuvok and Balana and just going down the line until as all of them are just we're already home, Captain. <laughs> you know, something like that. It would probably be Tom who would say that of all people, but you get the point. Well, I'm, I'm already home. I don't know about you guys. And then there would be a light laugh, you know, and then and we'll still mention to the rest of the crew, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I would have some mention somewhere that, you know, some of the crew did decide to stay. Just a few members. Don't even need to name them. It's not relevant. It really isn't. Because it wouldn't be very many people, I don't think, in all honesty, for reasons that I won't go into uh, immediately. But you get the point. And finally... You know, they say, all right, uh, let's go ahead and set a course forward. We need, And I w uh, as usual, I like to have a little bit of episode-to-episode -episode continuity, and I really need to start doing that more often. So, you know, I'd have a mention of the fact that we need to make another shuttle stop soon, which will lead directly into initiations. And so, okay, we'll go do that and set a course for the Baori. Maximum warp. And that's the end of the episode. Man, my throat hurts. Hopefully, that was relatively enjoyable. That was also relatively short. Go figure. The whole point of that episode is partially set up. Uh, that's probably pretty obvious. Um, but the other point of that episode was really to emphasize that the first step has been made. Obviously these people are not closer than close. Obviously these people still want to get home. But the thought is now there that, as, as, I, mentioned, as I made Tom mention, to some extent or another they are home. That they do have a home, you know? They do have friends. They do have family. They are not alone. And they want to keep going together, you know? And one of the hidden themes in all of that is that Janeway's desire to make the best of the situation isn't exclusive to her. That several of the others like the, f the, the good that they have gotten out of this bad situation, and they don't want to let go of that good any more than she does. So, I'm, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to go ahead and get ready for my next video. I'll talk to you guys later.